Hi, it's the MLM for the Soul Channel, and I do have a new topic for today. Before I begin, I just would like to say, may the words and expressions of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of my heart find favor and acceptance before you, Hashem. And so people I thank have inspired me. I hope they can inspire you as well. And I will have links below this video to their sites. They are Rabbi Shalom Arash, Rabbi Laser Brody, Rabbi Yossi Mizrahi, Rabbi Eli Mansour, Rabbi Elon Anava, Rabbi Yuval Ovadia, Rabbi Daniel Asser, Nason Baruch Black, David Sachs, Rabbi Michael Skobak, Jews for Judaism, Rabbi David Ashir, and Rabbi Yaron Ruvain. As well, if you've never checked out this channel before, I will have a link right below this video to my first video that explains what MLM for the Soul means, what it stands for, and what I'm doing. So today is going to be part two. This is from the Art Scroll Masora series. Uh, Zemirot Le Shabbat. Um, this is what it looks like. And this is a large size. They also have a smaller size edition. And again, I just want to dedicate this to the elevation of the soul of Rav Meir, uh, Rabbi Meir Ben Harav Aaron Zlatowicz, who passed away the end of uh, last month. It was Lamed of um, Sivan. And um, so. And because this is from his uh, series, this was put out in the early 70s or late 70s uh, when he was just starting out, I believe. Yeah, and uh, I will have a link also below to Art School so you can check out all that they offer as well. So, last week we, I started on the Aisha's Chayel to talk to mention that do the commentary here because I thought it was very interesting. So, I'm going to do this in three parts so it's not so long. So, where I left off last time, I'm going to find that here was uh, verse number 7, so I'm going to continue from there and do a couple pages and then finish it up as on Hashem next week. Uh, so it goes, the next one goes, deva mipri She envisions a field and buys it from the fruit of her handiwork. She plants a vineyard. So when it says, um, she envisions a field, she makes plans to embark on a venture and, is, and immediately she carries them out. Her plans are neither idle nor impractical. That's from Tzudo. So meaning she... So it goes ahead and does it. She doesn't just say she's going to do it and just doesn't do it. Mipri uh, chapeh from the fruit of her handiwork. After realizing a profit from her field, she goes on to further investments, i.e. arranging for the planting of a vineyard. However, she does not do the planting herself because such physical labor is unbecoming to a woman. So that's for Ebenezer, meaning, you know, a woman doesn't do that. It's not modest. So she has other people, but she plants it. Um, and then when it says sadeh and kerem, a field and a vineyard, so the chasam sofer homiletically interprets Sadeh as an excuse me, unproductive, unproductive field symbolizing people whose spiritual potential goes unrealized, since the fruit of the vine is used in sanctification and blessing. The Kerem represents a spiritually productive vineyard. This symbolizes a rich spiritual life. Uh, thus, the Aishas Chayel directs productive criticism at people who, like a field, ignore their spiritual obligations. The fruit of her concern is that they accept her guidance, change their ways, and become like a fertile vineyard. So that's, that's how you compare it, where she gives people that, as we say, constructive criticism, is another way to say it, and then hopefully they will do something to change. So next verse, uh, 8, Chagra uh, va'oz matneha v'tame uh, uh, yeah, otecha. With strength she girds her loins and invigorates her arms. So when it says, Chagra uh, va'oz matneha v'tame otecha, which is just a short one, short verse, uh, with strength she girds her loins and invigorates her, ar her arms. As is common in scriptural poetry, both halves of the verse state the same idea, but in different words. She is determined to carry out her responsibilities and summon up all her strength and energy in order to do so. That's from the two those. The Rabag, however, differentiates between the two clauses of the verse. She girds her loins to run quickly to the mitzvah and invigorates her arms to perform it. Very nicely put. And the Malbim comments that she is equally dedicated to both areas, both of her areas of responsibility, her work outside the home and her duties to the family. So, meaning both. And uh, Rav Hirsch comments that although she was not naturally strong, she made herself strong by her sense of responsibility and zeal. Okay, uh, nine. She discerns that her enterprise is good, so her lamp is not stuffed, snuffed out by night. So when it says, I said it wrong, excuse me. She discerns that her enterprise is good. When she realizes, when she recognizes, excuse me, that her business ventures are profitable, she resolves to see them through, even though it means she will have to stay up late. As a result, she keeps her lamp burning late into the night, Ebenezer and Mitsudos. In its allegorical sense, the soul perceives the value of its Torah pursuit so clearly that it sacrifices sleep willingly in order to continue studying by the light of the lamp from Rabad, or until it perceives the full spiritual uh, brilliance of the lamp of the Torah. That's from Beis Yaakov. 
So the word ta'am is used to express perception both in the physical and intellectual senses. Thus, it may refer either to the tasting of food or to the understanding of a concept. In our context, the Aishas Chayel feels the worthiness of her pursuit as keenly as if she were tasting food, meaning like the spiritual and the physical. So, uh, next, uh, 10. Her hands she stretches out to the dis dis distaff and her palms support the spindle. So, kishar and falech. So, the kishar, the distaff, is a staff which holds the fibers, which are fed into the palach, which is the spindle. The spindle is a rounded, tapered rod on the spinning wheel, which is used to twist the fibers into thread. Thus, this verse describes the industrious Asia's child who applies herself to the task of making clothes for a family or to sell as a profit, at a profit. Although she engages in commerce, as, as seen in the previous verses, she does not neglect the personal needs of her family. That's what she does. So, meaning, that comes first you know, always, and then hopefully that, you know, the idea of putting them together is like she makes clothes for her family and then she has extra, like she could use that, do that same thing and provide for others and, and you know, as a, as a means for uh, making um, money. Uh, okay? Then uh, 11, Kappa Karsala Ani Badal Shilchal Evion. She spreads out her palm to the poor and extends her hands to the destitute. So, uh, when she says Kappa Parsha she spreads out her palms to the poor and extends her hands to the destitute. An evion, a destitute person, is in a more desperate position than an ani, poor person. So there's different ways to say, like, different types of poor people. From what I understand, I think in, in the Torah they say there's different ways to describe them. Uh, the more than one word, and there's different levels. So the Aisha's Chayel helps both, but she recognizes that one is more needed than the other. Therefore, to the poor person, poor person, she opens her hands, allowing him to take what he wishes. But to the destitute one, she takes the initiative and in helping by extending her hands to give him what he needs. Mitsudos, meaning, so the poor person, she just lets him take. The other person can't, so he, she actually helps. Another indication that she is more zealous in helping needier people is the use of the plural yadeha, which I didn't pay attention to. That's very interesting um, that it's in plural. Her hands, um, her hand, yadaffer, her hands, in con connection with the destitute person. While to the less unfortunate poor person, the, the singular kapa, her palm is used. So that's interesting. This teaches that one should measure his response according to the situation. That's from Eitz Yosef. So note the use of the word kaf, palm, and yad, hand. The same words used in the preceding verse to describe her work um, at the spinning wheel. Interesting, I didn't notice that. Let me see. Yeah. Kapeha, right, Kapeha, and uh, what was the other word? Yadeha. Yeah, that's very interesting. That was in the previous verse. This means to imply that the Aishas Chayel recognizes her obligation to devote part of her profits to the less fortunate, going to Mabim. By doing so, she elevates her business activity to a higher status, Rabak. So she makes her her uh, work like into a, for a holy purpose. So that's what we always try to do uh, all the time. Okay, next, verse 12. Loti Raleveta Mishaleg Kichol Beta Levushanim. She fears not snow for her her household, for her entire household is clothed with scarlet wool. So when it says ki achol beit talavush, for her entire household is clothed, this, despite her interest in the poor, which is from the verse before, she does not neglect to prepare her own family for the impending winter malam. So that important. Her family has to come first and then help them others. Shanim, scarlet wool, Midr Socher Tov renders the word homiletically as shnayim, instead of shanim, it, which is interesting. It alludes to the com commandment of charity and generosity, which the Torah sometimes states in a repetitive fashion. Keep fatoach tiftach yedecha. Open shall you open your hands. That's from Deuteronomy. Naton titain lo. Give shall you give. It's also from Deuteronomy. Or Dvar. Repetition implies that one should have performed the good deed over and over again in all possible ways. Even though he may feel that he has done his share. That's from Bhagavad Gita. Okay, next verse, 13. Um... Marvadim astala sheish v'argaman lavusha. Luxurious bedspread she made herself. Linen and purple wool are her clothing. So it's interesting how a lot of these verses talk about clothing and different types of uh, material. So when it says marvadim astala, luxurious bedspread she made herself, Hashem blessed her so that whatever she makes is beautiful and of excellent quality, according to Mom. While the distinguished Asia's Chayel is praised most highly for her sense of duty and responsibility to others, she does not neglect herself. We find in Shabbos 114a that a Torah scholar deserves to die if he has stains on his clothing because he thereby disgraces the Torah. Yeah, I've heard that. That's that's like a real uh, um, disgrace. You know, like you're you're disgracing Hashem. Like you shouldn't be having stains. You know, it's a real embarrass embarrassment. Um, and that it is degrading for him to wear tattered clothes. Similarly, a distinguished woman should act and dress in keeping with her position. So we're Benos or 
children, you know, daughters of Hashem. We represent Him. So when we go out into the world, we should look, we should dress the part. You know, you don't have to dress overly fancy. And uh, according to Tzniyas, you're not supposed to be wearing a lot of makeup, a lot of jewelry, fancy, very fancy clothes. But you should be put together, look nice, look well dressed, you know, like dressed to your capacity so that you, you represent something out in the world and you want to show that. Okay, um, the bedspreads are made to comply with the mitzvah. That bed should be neat, neatly covered in honor of the Shabbat from Shir Tzion. So yeah, for Shabbat we always make everything nicer, nicer. You know, uh, dishes you're supposed to use and, and tablecloths. Like it's supposed to be holy. It's supposed to be elevated and supposed to be you know done in that way. Sheish ragaman linen and purple wool. Both are materials of high quality. They were among those used in the construction of the tabernacle. And the making of the priestly garments for the Kohen and the Kohen Gadol, as was the scarlet wool of the previous verse. That's from uh, Shmos. Levusha are her clothing. The clothing referred to in this verse symbolizes virtuous character traits and courteous behavior, which are the outward manifestation of the inner person from Ralbach. Again, everything material, spiritual. It's like talking inner, outer. So interesting. Okay, um, next one. Noda Bashar and Bala Bishifto Mzikne Aretz. Distinctive in the councils is her husband when he sits with the elders of the land. So when it says Anodah B'Shar Bala, distinctive, known, I mean, in the councils, uh, gates, which are in the gates, uh, literally meaning, is her husband. The beautiful garments tailored for him by the Ashes Chayal makes her husband stand out when he takes part in the councils of distinguished men. The word Sha'aram, literally gates, is used throughout scripture to denote gathering of elders and leaders, according to Mitsudos. A function of the Ashes Chayal's greatness is suggested by the context of the chapter in which the woman is described as active in commerce as well as in caring for her family, while her husband takes part in the councils of elders, she utilizes her business acumen to enable her husband to devote himself to Torah study. As a result, he becomes worthy enough to sit among the sages and contribute to the spiritual welfare of the people. Quinta Malam, so that's very interesting. Like she gets him, make sure he's dressed nicely, and that he can go out and do that involve the Torah while she's providing. So that's that's how how uh, it works for it with an anxious child. The term zakain elder implies wisdom, for it is an acronym of zeshekanachachma. Interesting too. Um, the person who has acquired uh, wisdom. That's uh, according to Rashi in uh, Leviticus, which is Vayikra. So the Zohar in ba for, from Vayera 103 interprets Sha'arim as measures or degrees. As we find in Abrashis, that Yitzhak was so blessed by Hashem that his harvest was mea Sha'arim a hundredfold, i.e. a hundred times as much as the normally anticipated harvest. While it is impossible for any human being to truly, quote, know Hashem's essence, people vary in their perceptions of Hashem according to their own level of spiritual accomplishment. Thus, Noda Bashar and Bala, her husband, i.e., Hashem, who is the master of Israel, is known by various degrees, according to the respective uh, spiritual level of levels of each individual. Okay, and then finally, the last verse for today, and then the rest, like I said, we'll finish next time. So, Din Astava Timkar Vechagarnat Malaknani, she makes a cloak to sell and delivers a belt to the peddler. So, Din a cloak, the translation follows in the Tudus, describes Sudden as a garment with which one enwraps himself. In Mishnaic uh, Hebrew, however, sudden is a sheet, in which case it would be rendered in our verse as bed linen. According to Mitsudos, our verse gives another instance of the Aishas Chayal's commercial activity to provide for her husband. Malbim, however, comments that she will distribute the income from these seals to distribute to the poor. The merit of her good deeds, as the next verse continues, will be her, ra her raiment, her soul's garment of honor, after she removes her bo quote, bodily clothing, i.e. after she dies. So that, that like I said, I won't be doing today. So when it says, then it goes, Sadin, Abatim Chor Laknani, a cloak to sell and a belt to the peddler. So Tiferes Hashabs notes that although she sells the cloak or bed linen herself, she distributes the belts through peddlers. Belts are masculine apparel, and the modest Aishas Chal does not go about among men to sell them. Hirsch infers that, um, and this means Rav Hirsch, I would imagine, that the context of this verse would indicate that it does not deal with her commercial prowess, for that discussion was concluded earlier. Rather, he notes our verse is a further elucidation of the Aishas Chal's character. This is further indicated by the change of verb in connection with the belt. From Mahra, she sold to Natna, she gave. That's interesting, too. I didn't notice that. Um, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, the verse shows how percepti perceptively and intelligently she carried out her charitable intentions. The threads left over from her weaving of the sudden would have been of limited value. Therefore, she fashioned them into a belt. Even th that she sought to turn to maximum benefit. She gave it to a poor peddler who could gain more from it than anyone else. Thus, her wise and prudent behavior continued to serve as an example to her husband in his deliberation relations among the Council of Elders. So that's very interesting, these few verses that I read about how it talks about her using things for commerce and then how she can apply it to make it into a higher level for holiness and how she can help others with charity. And we can learn a lot from this by what we do on a daily basis. 
And I hope and pray that uh, we can all do and, and be like Aisha Kyle and implement these different character traits and for men too it doesn't that have to be just for women but and that we will all merit to live and see the coming of Mashiach speedily in our days and the rebuilding of our final and everlasting base Hamigdash Amen and thanks for watching